Okay, we are back with the fifth episode of the Millennial Entrepreneur Podcast. Having started my own business while studying at university and getting funding from O2, I love following the journeys of other young entrepreneurs. In this conversation, we talk to Simi Dillon from Rice and Spice, who started his meal delivery service from his university kitchen to now turning over six figures in revenue, providing food to Premier League winners and reality TV stars. We talk also about how his mum was a massive motivation for him and that he used RNS to allow her to retire early. Thanks to everyone for the support so far. It's been absolutely phenomenal. And we've got some amazing guests coming up next week, so be sure to stay tuned by subscribing and also following us on the new Instagram page. Um, the links are in the description. As always, if you enjoyed the episode, it would be amazing if you could leave a five-star rating and a review, as it really does help us out. All right, let's go on the episode. Hey, Simi, how are you? Not bad, thanks. How are you? I've been trying to get you on the podcast for a long time, so it's really good to finally sit down and uh, record this episode. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, been really busy these past few months, and yeah, no, it's, it's good to, to be on finally as well. Yeah, because I was in Bristol for a startup competition, and we were meant to meet up afterwards to record the first ever episode, actually, um, of the Millennial Entrepreneur Podcast. Uh, but then you got busy, and the whole like coronavirus thing hit, so so all that got in the way. Um, How's RNS actually doing in the whole coronavirus situation? I think uh, we've been very lucky in terms of the fact that we are like a, a meal delivery service and like offering an essential product. And also the fact that we are quite small and nimble, that we've been able to adapt quite well. Um, and RNS HQ is actually like a 10 minute walk from our house. And obviously it's quite a family business. So we're all kind of self-isolating together, going to the unit together. And then we have a few kind of local people working with, with us. So it has gone really well. Like we've not been too like, adversely affected. And obviously, lots more people are. We've we've had quite a, a turnover in, in in terms of clients. So we've had some people leave because a lot of clients are self-employed, people who are really busy. And at the same time, we've had lots of new clients come in and people who probably we wouldn't normally serve. Um, so really opening ourselves up to different um, audiences at the moment. Yeah, that's pretty good in a way if you think about it because you're getting your product out there to audiences that otherwise wouldn't have you know thought about discovering RNS. Yeah, definitely and. Even at the same time, like in terms of a business point of view, um, we did see our costs shoot up quite a lot. Um, like it, I think when things were first kind of like all up in the air, I think maybe some suppliers were quite opportunistic and raising prices and we've kind of seen them level out now. Um, so that's good. But um, no, we did um, in response to everything that was going on, we did like cut prices for um, NHS staff and uh, anyone vulnerable. And at the same time, we kind of froze prices for our other clients. Um but no, yeah, like overall as a business, we've kind of like managed to grow from it as well. Um, but I do think that we're only kind of seeing the beginning of the growth. And as things begin to normalize, we have kind of retained the new clients who we kind of reached. Um, and we start getting back the old clients who maybe had to take some time off. So I think, yeah, at the, at the end of it all, we'll kind of come out of it very like in a very strong position. We're kind of blabbering on about um, kind, of, kind of how the coronavirus has hit RNS. Why don't, why don't you actually tell people what, what rice and spice RNS is? Okay, um, so yeah, it's kind of always changing and always evolving, and something that we'll probably will come on to speak about later on how it might change in the future. But um, it's effectively a, a meal prep service. So we have maybe just over a hundred clients between hundred and hundred and fifty, and these people we sign up to us on a subscription, um, and every week they'll get a new menu to choose from, and they'll pick um, so I would say delicious, healthy, chef-made meals um, delivered to your door. Um, and they can choose various different meals. We offer vegan meals as well now. And they can choose them in like different portion sizes. So they can have a standard portion, a high carb or a low carb based on their needs. And basically we like take advantage of the fact that people order in advance. We buy in bulk from our suppliers. Uh, we have chefs working in a commercial kitchen. We produce on scale. Um, then we chill everything using like, um, like commercial grade bath chillers, portion everything, and then we deliver it to doors. Um, and because we operate within say 20 uh, miles of kitchen, which is in Hertfordshire, um, we yeah. do everything ourselves. We don't outsource anything. Everything is cooked from scratch. Even our delivery drivers are kind of family friends kind of thing. Um, so it's all a very like, personal oh, service. Cool. Um, yeah. So it's basically healthy meals delivered to your door and saving people time, improving the health and yeah. enjoyment of food, really. How long How long you been going for? So it was three years in February. So it's about three, just over three years now. Um, and it, very, it started off as a different business. It was just... Um, in university, just literally, um, there was one meal option, just a jerk chicken and rice, and it was um, just a healthy. Yeah, I remember. I remember uh, that. <laughs> a healthy takeaway. Um, 
and it was just that one and option. And then from that, I thought, hang on a minute, like students are probably like the most difficult audience in terms of having money to, to like spare money, and they're very like kind of not, not tight, but like very kind of like frugal. Um, and will cook for themselves if they if they can, or they get Domino's. They go like with a trusted takeaway. I thought I'd try it out and see how it worked, and it working quite. It was working quite well. Um, so from the back of that, I got my brother, and my mum to start back home, um, delivering to just normal people who we thought would be a lot easier to target because because potentially they have less time to cook and also have more disposable income, and it's like going really well. And then we actually realised, hang on a minute, takeaways are quite difficult. It's a very saturated market. There's there's food waste involved because obviously you have to you don't really know when the orders can come in. It's very difficult to manage stock and inventory. Um, and then we just thought, why don't we just get into meal prep because we're quite a healthy family anyway. Something that we're doing for ourselves. Um, so we started kind of doing both takeaways and meal prep, and then we just realised that the meal prep was just the best market that we could go to. It was like every like we were yeah. just really set up. Um, everything was set up in our favour to to do that. So we just kind of like pivoted towards that and. That's, yeah, maybe for the last two and a half years. And then we've kind of just really focused on that since. I'd love to talk to you about um, how how was the whole like thought process around starting in your university kitchen? Yeah, like that must have been a weird sort of thing to start, no? Yeah, no, it was. Um, so I, I thought about starting something like this before uni. And I just realized that, hang on a minute, how am I actually going to do this? Where is the, how am I just going to serve random people? It's not going to work. I have to have a proper premise, all this kind of stuff. Um, so I actually started it, uh, I did first term of uni, um, and then after my exams in first term, like the week that we had in between, it's kind of like a reading week, um, just started, decided to start it then. So tested a few recipes, but okay, I've got something good here. Um, and then I kind of sat down and I sat down with one of my, um, my close friends from first year, Tyrone, and like I live with him second year, we're still really close now. Um, and I was like, oh, how should I market this? How should we do this? And we set up the Facebook page. And then from then, I just was like, okay, I'm just going to do it from my kitchen. And because I was in Stoke Bishop, which is like the student complex of like 2,000 students, I thought, okay, there's a huge market here. I can literally deliver everyone like on foot. Like they can meet me by the bus stop kind of thing. And then just started it and see how it went. And I kind of always thought, okay, it's going to go well because people can't really cook here. Um, it's cheap. It's affordable. And like the fact that I was in that kind of quite secluded um, student complex, the only real takeaway option was Domino's and it felt like, felt like kind of people were sick of that and they just couldn't be bothered to cook so yeah yeah that was the kind of logic behind it and i just thought why not yeah for people who don't know stoke bishop um so high baker where i think you were right it's in the middle of nowhere it's literally there's nothing around so for you to start this but there's so many students that's the thing and it's kind of very unique to university where you do get a big community of students concentrated in one area that might not be close to you know food places so yeah you very much saw that opportunity it was really cool for you to kind of deliver it at scale where like at you know somewhere else you wouldn't have been able to start it yeah uh, i was actually in a um city center halls for the first couple of weeks and I, I really wanted to be in stoke bishop i applied for that as my first choice but i didn't get that so i actually only moved into and a lot of people don't realize this because it just felt like i was there the whole time but um i only moved to stoke bishop after maybe six or seven weeks so half of first time had gone um, and then obviously I started in the second term. So had I not moved tools, I probably wouldn't have started the business, which is quite mad to think about. Oh wow! No, I didn't. I didn't know that about you. Yeah, it's crazy to think. And I think so. You talked about you talked about the whole marketing thing. Um, one thing the the way I kind of found out about rice and spice was actually through your Facebook page. One of my friends got tagged in one of your posts um, with like a quote that he said about your food. Yeah. I can't remember what it was off the top of my head now. Um, but yeah, it was something like, this is like sick or whatever. It was yeah. something like very, yeah, it was quite funny. Yeah. And that's how I found out about it because he was tagged in yeah. it. Is that the kind of, is that the way that you grew? It was very, you know, efficient marketing yeah. for the so like kind of audience that you were going yeah, after. Yeah, I, I feel like um, what we started off is kind of like being, because obviously students and university is such a, like a, such a light-hearted place and like everyone's kind of like trying to banter each other and it's all like kind of people at the beginning actually thought it was a joke like it wasn't actually selling meals it was just kind of random people sending a photo i thought i thought it was a joke at first as well actually <laughs> yeah yeah uh, it was funny um and then like i just realized that we kind of fed in like at first i was like okay cool. social media is a place to market and i'm not paying for any ads so i just made the page and, and kind of like tag people and i realized that the reach when on facebook because we started purely on facebook 
and now pretty much we're very heavily on Instagram and not as much on Facebook. Um, but I just realized that if if you go on your Facebook feed and someone tags you, it, go, it shows to all of your friends and obviously the page, it obviously shows to everyone who you're friends with. But if you have a page as opposed to a person, um, it, the, the reach of the post is very much like reduced. Um, so I actually started off as I made a personal page and the name of the person was Rice and Spice and added loads of people. And that's how it really grew because had I started it as a page, the reach would have been like a lot worse and I don't think it would have taken off. Um, but yeah, just tagging like, and we always try to make it really lighthearted and it's funny because some people are quite like unsure. So we're not, because obviously I deliver everything on foot and speak to the people and lots of people are really interested want to have like a real long conversation. And then I was like, oh, can we grab a photo? And they're like, yeah, sure. Um, in fact, some people I'm pretty sure just ordered so that they can get their photo on the page. Um, but it was just always quite funny trying to come up with a quote for the page because I didn't really want to put anything on that was boring um, to keep it really interesting and stuff. But yeah, I think that that was really effective marketing in the early days. Yeah, especially because, as we kind of alluded to before, university is a very unique kind of community where everyone kind of knows each other and people yeah. have mutual connections with kind of everyone. And, you know, you're never like one or two connections away from someone else in the university, if that makes sense. So if someone posts something, you're bound to see it. And it's very unique with the university community. Um, so probably if you did start this with not in the university community, it might not have taken off and grown as fast yeah. as it did. Yeah, I agree, definitely. And uh, there was literally no cost to doing that. It was all like organic. I didn't have to pay for any of that. So yeah, uh, it just made so much sense. Yeah, and just echoing the point that you made on, on the whole thing, like university is a very unique and special place where, I, I don't know, and especially in first year, like everyone just kind of wants everyone to do really well. It's just such a like nice thing. Um, and like you start off not really knowing anyone and then you finish knowing kind of everyone. Um, yeah, it's really weird. And it even happens now when obviously I'm kind of like in fourth year because I took a year off to work on the business. And even now like, I feel like, oh, there's not many people around that you know because obviously those who've graduated. And then you bump into people and who I don't even know. And they'll be like, oh, we'll got to start speaking and somehow the business will come up or inevitably business will come into conversation. And they'll be like, oh yeah, I know that thing. Or so I know so-and-so who had the meals in first year. And it's really weird how like, yeah, in first year, I feel like everyone kind of knew about it. It was really strange. To kind of like explain the business a bit more in the early stages. So people were ordering from the personal Facebook page, you know, like messaging you or, or phoning you. Yeah. And then you'd personally go and actually deliver it to them. The, the yeah, jerk so, chicken and rice and peas, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I like, heavily focus on... Um, so Bishop and I would just like literally post every so often or if someone bought a meal I'd post them and then say okay just contact this number to order or message, uh, message I say us even though it's just me to order um and then <laughs> I'd just cook in the kitchen and deliver it to them and like I could pretty much tell okay it was every evening because everyone was kind of at uni during the day um so Monday to Friday it was during, it was during the day and I just whip up a few portions and, and, and deliver them and I'd normally get people to meet me by the bus stop or something yeah. to deliver to them and then on the weekends was when it was really busy um, because obviously the catered halls um, didn't have dinner on the weekends. So I'd really target the catered hall, uh, catered halls um, and, and try and get like, it was really great when uh, I kind of celebrated it when it was like someone had managed to convince their flatmates to, to order. So I used to have a couple of friends who on, on the Sunday, him and all these flatmates would order together. Um, so that was a good like five, six orders. Um, and it was great compared to like during the week sometimes when you'd be like scrapping around to get a couple of orders in. Um, but it was really funny and kind of scrappy and like there was no like pressure at all because of no cost really well you say you say there's no pressure but with something like the personal touch that you definitely injected into the business in especially in the early stages where you were kind of replying to every message and even even now actually you're still yeah. replying to every message yeah that must get so hectic no because you must have you know your dms are just full of just orders yeah you know it, it does get really hectic and yeah, and I think a lot about like the scalability of it with this, um, like in the way that we're doing it. But I don't know. I feel like for the time being, it, it's okay. And like there are ways. And like I feel like it is obviously very hectic. And I wouldn't say that it's pressure. It's more of a responsibility now that to kind of always do this. Not to an extent, yeah. a pressure, yeah. But I feel like that's what's helped us be like really unique. And kind of like now as we go forward and grow, it's like that's what's attracting people to come towards us. Um, yeah, and, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think the personal touch is definitely underrated in business and then you're like a perfect example of of how, you know, uh, how it can be utilized to grow, I think. I was going to say, yeah, in, in, especially in like 
something like food where it's so competitive it's so hard to differentiate yourself um you need to like leverage every every difference that you can and really kind of like amplify it you kind of you made a point earlier that i, I really love, love to touch upon where you talked about university being an amazing per, uh, an amazing place to start a business you know what would you like to highlight with the most important things to start like why would you convince how would you convince someone to start at university basically this is a, another really important thing and i think it's first year of university when you have so much free time when your exams don't really count and when i i say that yeah everyone at university is really nice and especially so in first year but as you get into second and third year like it becomes a lot more kind of cliquey where people maybe aren't so willing to help out and like they kind of fall into their group and people kind of want to be seen as being cool if you know what i mean so how they started yeah on second year it's more like oh no that's kind of that's not really cool i don't want to do that whereas in the first year everyone's like willing to write anything um and i think as well like it's so easy like everyone knows that when you go to university in, in, in like the first term, in the first year, you can literally chat to anyone and anyone will give you the time of the day. You can speak to anyone about anything and like it's not seen as weird. I think as you go into second, third year, people get a, more, a lot more kind of like... <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely agree. Really. And, but so yeah, I definitely think first year is the best time to do it. And also that you've got like so many people with so many different skills. Obviously, it depends on what university you're at. But again, this wasn't why... Um, this wasn't why it kind of in first year it was a good thing to start, but like since first year, how lot like from Bristol, I've met so many different people who put me into contact with so many different people from the business in terms of like designers, developers, um, even like uh, do, do you want me mentors? There's so many different like resources available. Um, and again, I think a big thing is that is the the lack of pressure because as you get older and like if, if you want to start a business after university, like I've got lots of friends now who have tried to start businesses in their last year of university or when they graduate and there is so much pressure on them in terms of like making sure it's a success and also there's huge opportunity costs because when you're in first and second year and even mainly first and second year it's like if you're not i was just thinking like what is the opportunity cost what is the alternative that you would be doing and it's pretty much just chilling with your mates or like going out and like you have enough time to do that you can do that um and even yeah. if you can make the business with your mates kind of thing um yeah i just think it's just it's kind of a, a no-brainer to try it and like if it fails you just laugh and it's failed and you haven't lost anything whereas yeah exactly it's just a learning curve and also like the risk is so minimal and i know a lot of people would say wait just like i don't have any money to start but every university that i've that i've seen has some sort of scheme to promote entrepreneurship in university they have they have a, a big budget um, and I think you applied to some like uh, scheme as yeah, well yeah. with the university. They gave you some money yeah, also. Yeah. So like, yeah, the, the risk is so minimal. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think, yeah, Bristol University is really good as well. Um, and like the enterprise team there are great. Having, having said that, though, I remember in the first year, um, I didn't actually speak to the enterprise team at all for like a good 12 months uh, after I started the business, maybe even longer than that. Um, because in the first year I was like oh where can I find a premises or a kitchen to cook in where can I do all this that kind of stuff and re literally really unhelpful um, in terms of just like the estate's office and all that kind of stuff uh, and I just thought oh I should do it myself uh, see how it works and then after that getting uh, more more support and help uh, was great I think yeah, yeah another thing I'd say is just like I think a lot of people will kind of want their hand held and kind of like oh if there's resources available I need to use them I need them to tell me what to do I think just starting by yourself and just using a bit of common sense and intuition and just a bit of like oh I want to sell this, I need to build it, I need to market it, I need to sell it. And then after that, you've actually got something to show people. Whereas like, I think a lot of time, uh, like the people at the enterprise office or just even like potential mentors will think, oh, this this guy or this girl has come to me and asked for help, but they've literally shown no initiative. And like, I can give them help, but like a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell them, they could have done themselves and then come to me with more specific problems. So I think the best thing is always to start early um, get a bit, good bit of work done, and and kind of carry on going, like struggle a bit, um, and then ask for help afterwards. But there, are, I think there are lots of people out there willing to help. And yeah, university is a place where like everyone's like, people are really intelligent. They've got lots of good ideas, um, and they have free time, so it's just kind of perfect environment. And also, your your business has pivoted massively. So you did struggle within the early stages, but as not the early stage, but you kind of hit scalability, and then yeah. you kind of wanted to pivot the business. So it's okay to struggle in the early stages as well and, you know, kind of change your ideas of what you want your business to be. Yeah, like I think lots of people ask me and like it's really strange actually at the moment how but lots of friends, I think like entrepreneurship is this kind of thing that's been kind of very much like glamorized and everyone wants to do it now. Um, and lots of friends saying, oh, I'm starting this business, can I get a bit of advice on this, that or the other? And um, 
it, 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 and they're like, oh, how did you like, did you have a business plan? Did you have this? Can you send me like a template? And I was like, I don't have a business plan. I never have. And I probably never will. Um, and, and just kind of starting and just thinking, okay, this is a good idea. Let's run with this. Let's see how it works. And just constantly kind of changing and pivoting because like things are always going to change. Yeah. Like, the coronavirus has showed that. And like the business who have been able to adapt are obviously kind of doing really well. And like, it's okay, this is really like unprecedented like circumstances. And it's like a very like strange example, but like, there are always like conditions that are going to change, not as drastically as they have, but like just being able to adapt yeah. and, and kind of, you are always going to struggle. There are always going to be problems. And like, if you had no problems in your business, then someone else would just come in and set up the same business. Okay. So let's go back to the business within the early stages. So you, so it grew so fast and you're getting so many orders that you actually had to drop out of university for a year, right? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Well, well, that's, uh, that sounds like a good uh, story, and what I probably would tell people. Sounds um, like sounds like the Mark Zuckerberg of, of food delivery. <laughs> but no, like actually, like the truth is that it was. It's not that it was going so well and I had so many orders. The truth is that it was like we, it was just really busy, and I realised I had to give a lot of time and attention to the business. And had I, and it's just kind of a case of like either I had to make the decision where either I stop the business now and just leave it and it's been like fly and I've learned lots and gained great experience and focus on my degree and finish my degree or I have to actually put off, like stop university for a year and like give myself like time to set this up as a proper business because it wasn't a proper business before that it was just like very much me running around doing everything didn't really have like a proper facility it was not scalable at all um so I had to really make the decision where and it was a really difficult decision to make um because obviously lots of like different factors come into play like your well, for one like your accommodation the next year your or your mates graduating for you what employers would think if you take a year off like can you even take a year off um how exams would fit in and all, all that kind of stuff but like it was kind of the case in the second year where obviously i'd moved out of stoke bishop so it was very it was it was a lot more difficult to on rns in bristol uh, and that's when i kind of realized that hang on a minute this like operating for students to take away isn't like a viable market long term and like well it might be in a different form of the business but it's not what i want to yeah. do and to really pivot towards your prep yeah. and, and get our own like proper commercial kitchen and, and really go like like full scale on that um and that's what we kind of did yeah it must have been a really tough decision because uh yeah there, there must, there's just so many factors to consider especially when as you said it wasn't a scalable business at that point so you're kind of like thinking can it be scaled yeah um, and is it worth risking kind of a, a, like all those things that you said before? Sure. Yeah, no, definitely. And like, it was a really difficult decision and like, I really agonized over it so long. Um, wasn't sure. And even after I made the decision for the next like 12 months, 18 years, even up until um, pretty much until I finished that whole year out, I always thought, oh, should I have been taking this year out really, if you know what I mean? Um, and then after like yeah. enough time, you kind of realize, yeah, good decision and kind of carry on moving forward. Was there any moments where you kind of felt like there was a big moment of doubt in your mind where you thought you made the wrong decision? Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Like plenty of those. Um, like straight away after making it, like you think, ah, oh. you, you're always thinking because um, so I made the decision around January and second year. Um, that I'd fin carry on like doing second year, but I'd defer some of the exams. So then my third year was technically um, like second year again, whereas I was just in uh, hitching full time working on the business and then also doing exams. Um, and so like from that January up until September, always thinking, oh, sh am I making the right decision here? I could have just, just really stayed at uni, stayed with all my mates, graduated with them, um, gone into like a nice comfy, like salary after uni and so all that kind of stuff. And then even when I took the year off, kind of thinking about, um, uh, like kind of investing a lot of money into the business and like, oh, should I continue to invest money and time into it? Or should I go and spend my time elsewhere? Um, but I think it like, it came to the point where I was just like, there's no point in carrying on thinking about this and wasting time like I'm an houring and just kind of give it my all. I've given this year off. No matter what happens, like yeah. just do whatever I can this year and then see what happens after that because there was no going back on the decision then. Yeah. I guess it's best to not live with that regret of kind of what could have been. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you know what definitely. I mean. Um but it's also really difficult to like I think it sounds like objectively it's easy to say it and like even now looking back on it, um, it's easy to say it. But like when you're in the moment and you think, ah, oh, and you're seeing what other people are doing and you're thinking, oh, this is really long and you're staying up really late and you're having to do like basically shit jobs and you're just like, oh, what's going on here? Um, and it's difficult not to think about those other things. But then, yeah, I think ultimately 
like there's only so much you can do and like you're going to waste a lot of time if you do carry on thinking about what if or this or that and just kind of just make a decision and just go with it yeah so you wants to you wants to set it up in your hometown uh, of Hitchin, right? So what was your kind of thought process? Because obviously it's a different sort of environment than a student community. So yeah, what was your sort of th- thought process around that? So after I set it up in Bristol, I got my brother and mum to start in Hitchin and they were both going well, but I was just like, oh, it just makes so much more sense to do it in Hitchin because like I said before, you, you've got a proper audience as opposed to just students and students isn't like, it's very cyclical as well. It's like, not just term time and uh, holiday period, but it's the fact that at the beginning of the term, people have student finance and at the end of the term, they're broke, basically. Um, just so, like, having your proper audiences was just, like, a no-brainer. And then also, like, thinking about it being scalable and thinking about the staff and proper premises and all these kind of things. Um, so that was the kind of idea. And I was just like, yeah, let, let's give it a good go and hitch in. I think like, there's potential to, to really grow it there. I think uh, as well, after the first year, that summer, um, I just literally spent the whole summer working on the business uh and from there i was like okay cool there's potential here to, to grow this in mill prep came back to uni second year and i realized oh, there's there's too much like work to be done i need to like go back and not just have a summer to work on it but a whole year i think initially it was like we were lit like i've always thought that if you're gonna do something you have to do it really well and there's no point in like kind of half assing it kind of thing um so when we started off, I didn't want to try and like overextend and do too many different dishes if they weren't going to be as good as like the church. Basically. Yeah, of course. So like kind of set a high bar. Um, so I guess that we were kind of like quite safe in what we did in terms of like only offering good food and making sure that everything we did was really good and, and consistent and good quality and the customer would be happy. But then we didn't have that much time for kind of menu development because we were thinking so much about just growing the business and sorting out all like, do you know I mean? like putting out fires basically um, and worrying about lots of different tasks. And then as we have grown staff and uh, really grown the business and like kind of automated so many processes and now and even hired um, so many more chefs, it enables us to like really focus on menu development and, and, and offering so many more options. What's your favorite, what's your favorite R and S combination? Um, so I think, I think the satay chicken is really good. And it's really popular. Um, and then again, you have the original jerk. Uh, lots of like friends who say that. Like whenever I post a new jerk, they're like, ah, oh, you can't beat the original jerk. So yeah, I think the original jerk. Yeah, the, the jerk you can't beat the original. <laughs> yeah, I think that those those two are my favorites probably. Who's the who's the biggest person that you've served? I, I, I know that you fed like reality TV stars and, and professional football players, yeah. <laughs> but there must have been one that's really stood out in your mind. Um, I feel like because it was the first, it was like one of the first big people as well. It was um, Aki Fenwa, who's like, you know, like always rated like uh, strongest man on FIFA. But then again, yeah, yeah. there's also like Damari Gray, who's obviously won the Premier League, which is quite mad. Um, and then, yeah, then you've got the reality TV stars, but like, I don't really watch that kind of stuff. So like other people might find that really interesting, but I don't really care about yeah. that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I actually met Aki Fenwa. He's a really nice yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, very inspiring as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of um, uh, like a very close friend who I've known since we were like five or six. Um, he's a professional footballer, and he um, he basically plays for Wickham with like So they're really good mates. And like even the, a couple of months ago, Jay and, and the friend Nick Freeman, uh, they went to uh, LA on holiday and they were on holiday with like So like, I suppose like it's all it's all and it always it's always been kind of word of mouth and friends of friends. Um, so yeah, we've very much kept it that way. Yeah, that's definitely the thing that I really like about your business is that you utilize word of mouth so like amazingly. For me, it's like a really brilliant example of how word of mouth can be so powerful. Yeah, and I think um, to start off with, if I'm being honest, it's probably just out of like uh, cost saving um, and not wanting to spend money on marketing um, and just trying to do everything like as frugally as we can. Um, but having like done that, um, we just, just realize that it's so much you, you, you do need to start doing paid marketing eventually because um, there's only like certain, like there's a limit yeah. word of mouth can take you. Um, but yeah, like word of mouth is like, you can never like forget about word of mouth and it's always going to be so valuable. Like no matter what industry you're in, it, it's always going to be like the most valuable form of marketing. So the way, the, the business that you kind of set up now and where you are like currently, I saw a really, really nice Instagram post from you. I can't remember when, maybe a few, a few months ago now. It was about, it was a long post about your mum and how like she inspired you throughout this whole process and how you've actually, you know, 
made her retire early, which is a really nice story. So kind of talk to us about how did that kind of come about where, you know, your mum was a really big inspiration to you and then, yeah, you kind of retired her early as well now. Yeah, so I think, so something I didn't mention earlier was that I actually went to, I went to Warwick um, to study maths and dropped out uh, before I came to Bristol. Um, so when I was there and I, when I kind of dropped out, I kind of had this like kind of half gap year where I was just like, what am I doing? What am I doing with my time kind of thing? Um, and I was working, but it was just very boring and not kind of stimulating. So that's where I kind of actually was thinking about starting RNS first. Or was it called RNS? I just starting about thinking about starting a food business. And I just realized that it wouldn't be possible yeah. because like, how can I just start it on my own in like a half a gap year? Um, but during that year as well, I was really like kind of, because I had nothing to do. I tried to like start up my project to get a mum like a new or different job. And um, just because obviously throughout like our childhood, uh, me and Jay being at home like were always like really well looked after in terms of food, in terms of like taking us to football practice or school or wherever we wanted to go, she'd always take us there. And like without any kind of like complaint at all. And I didn't realize how like unique or special that was until obviously you speak to other people and find out how their experiences differ. But during that kind of yeah. period where maybe I was about 18, I was thinking, oh, let's get mom a job somewhere else um, where maybe she could like, in a way it's kind of like for her to like kind of start a career at whatever age she was at. And we just realized that it's just not possible. That is so difficult for, for a woman to kind of yeah. be like say mid forties, have not spent any time uh, in education in decades and like just literally focused on like kind of raising kids to then like start a career again. And uh, at the point I was like, we tried really hard, like looked at different uh, like courses, like open university, um distance learning all these kind of things and I just realized that like none of them like none of them would be like viable options in terms of they weren't set up for the circumstances that mum was in and I realized that there must be a lot of women out there like this um then I was just like to be honest like I don't have the time now to like if I'm you know I didn't have the time now to kind of like solve this problem and I just said to her like kind of kind of as a joke but kind of like I, I did believe it that um one day I'd have a business and I can just hire mum and train her up in this business and she'd really enjoy it and i didn't think that was gonna be a food business i didn't think it was gonna be rns i was just like oh yeah and then like as the business grew slowly grew slowly it was never that okay cool we're growing this business that mum can work in full time but it's just like it's just natural for us to say oh mum can you give us a hand and natural for her to say yes because that's all, what's always happened and then slowly over time we were like okay can you like give up more days where you're working so she's always just worked like part-time at, at tesco's um really flexible for her um and like working around us basically and so slowly she was maybe working like four or five days a week and then she's working three and then two and then one and then we we're just like why are you even still working there just quit and uh, you can work with us full time and that's kind of what happened so you're kind of a family family business now how is it being a family business um like it's there's obviously pros and cons like the the pros are that like we're all, like we get to spend a lot of time together and we get along really well which is great um from a marketing point of view it's also really great and everyone loves it and that our interests are all aligned and that it's like we all want the business to grow and we all want because we're all like kind of we'll all val uh, like benefit if it grows um and we all like kind of do have the same interest and like uh like vision for the business kind of thing um so like that's so important and i feel like in the business like people don't really realize about how just getting good staff where all of you are like it, moving in the same direction is so like rare and uh, valuable so that's like definitely the pros of it um and then, like, this this advantage. Another pro is that, like, I suppose this is a pro and a con that, like, the business never stops. And, like, even if we're at home at, like, even 11 p.m. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. cool. Um, you can't shut yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. So, again, like, it's an advantage in terms of, like, it means we're always working on the business, but it's also a disadvantage in terms of we don't get a break. Um, yeah. And then, like, yeah, I, I feel like there are very few disadvantages, but I think, like, the one is that you literally never get a break from it. How do you, how do you switch I off? I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah 24 7 rns to be honest like i feel like that's like uh something that i probably try to work on a lot more but yeah no i don't know like going on holiday had uh, uh, but then even when we're on holiday uh which like, it's normally me and jay or we go with friends and i'm still always working on the business i'm like in a way i i don't really want to like when some people say or oh, when you take time off or whatever and like, i feel like i don't need to have like a week or a month or a few days off and, I, and if i'm being honest i don't feel like for the last three years there's ever been a day when I've completely not touched RNS because it's, it's something where you're always thinking about it. Even if you're not like physically doing something, you're always thinking about it. Um, but just having breaks, from it, yeah. like, I don't know, just doing some exercise or chatting to a friend or 
you know I mean? Like just doing something different, um, reading something different, or even uni. That's kind of a break from RNS. So your break from RNS is to work on uni work, and I guess your break from uni work is to work on RNS. To an extent, yes. Um, but then also like just having like obviously now it's not ideal, but like even I suppose even now like just often I'll just call friends and we'll just be on the phone for a couple of hours just catching up about anything. Um, yeah, and another break is just exercising because I feel like that is something so different and it is like really like, intrinsically enjoyable. But yeah, just just taking some time out to just to chat to friends and catch up and maybe go for dinner or something like that. We're coming, we're coming kind of to the end of the podcast. Uh, so just uh, looking to the future. So how would how at what point do you think you'd you'd know that you've made it? What you, what point would you know that RNS has made it? Honestly, I feel like there'll never be a point that you've made it because you can never kind of make it. I was listening to this. I just saw this thing pop up on um, Instagram this morning, and the guy was saying. I think he's an actor. I don't remember his name. He was like saying how some, when he was 16, some guy asked him uh, who his hero is, whatever. And he said, oh, give me two weeks to come back to you. And then he came back and said, oh, it's me in 10 years. It's me when I'm 25. And at 25, he said, oh, it's me when I'm 35. I feel like it's the same with RNS. It's like, there'll never be a point where... Oh, it's Matthew, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, yeah, that was it. That was it. Um, but yeah, I feel like there are obviously things that would be really nice. Okay, like when you, uh, like let's say if ever we were like raised like millions or we sold this amount of mills or... Do you know what I mean we we were nationwide or we were worldwide or do you know what I mean all this kind of stuff is all all nice but then like even when you get maybe like ah oh, well, what's the next thing so I feel like just um there is no point when RNS makes it kind of thing it's just always like kind of there are obviously things that we want to do like nice things to to have and achieve um but yeah I, I feel like for me there's not any one particular thing um potentially um okay. I, I, well I would say potentially actually when um maybe I work on it full time because I feel like um, at the moment I, so I'm going to work for Google in October um, and I don't know how long I'll be there for and I don't know what like the future does hold but at the moment I'm not like, kind of yeah. going to work on RNS full time until like it's big enough for me to do so and maybe that will never happen and maybe it will just carry on like ticking over as like this nice family run local business um, but if it just gets to the stage where yeah. I then jump on it full time I feel like that would be a huge achievement and that is kind of something that maybe I want potentially want to do in the future but it might be in five years it might be ten years it might be in six months or, or it might never happen yeah but I think that would be something so while, while you're kind of working full time for Google you want it to almost sustain itself um, to a certain extent with not as much involvement as it does now is that right so that's kind of like the, like the I can't remember if it's like the school bus test or yeah. like the fire engine yeah, yeah. test which is basically like if you get hit for people that don't know if you get hit by like a, if the founder gets hit by like a car or something can the business still sustain yeah. itself so to be honest i honestly feel like it's like that now because i feel like if 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 for whatever reason i i, I couldn't work on rns anymore um i feel like it would continue to like operate and operate very well it just maybe wouldn't grow as much or it wouldn't like change or pivot as much um but yeah like I, I feel like as well, like Google's a great environment and there's so many like incredible people there who will always give me like new and different ideas. Um, so I'm really looking forward to yeah, going definitely. there and yeah, like letting RNS just kind of take over. And again, I'll always be working on it and there was lots of, lots of hours in the week and the weekends and the evenings and the mornings to be working on RNS. So yeah. All right. So we've kind of reached the end of the podcast um, episode. So really, yeah, massive pleasure talking to you. And as I said, I've been trying to get you on for a long time. So yeah, massive pleasure to have you on finally. Thanks a lot for having me on, yeah. It's been, yeah, it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so how can people kind of stay in touch with RNS, stay in touch with you in the future? Yeah, so uh, this always, whenever we go on radio to do interviews, it's always a bit of a mouthful, the uh, Instagram handle, and we think about changing it. Um, so the Instagram handle, like Instagram is our biggest kind of platform, um, is at rice underscore hen underscore spice underscore um the website is RNS. i'll leave in the description yeah. <laughs> the website is rnsmills.com um and facebook if you just type in rice and spice i'm sure it will come up um and then yeah if you if you fancy following me you can follow me on instagram at, at simi dylan underscore and linkedin simi dylan you can find me on there as well okay great thanks for being with me yeah thanks a lot and yeah we'll speak again soon i'm sure Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Millennial Entrepreneur Podcast. Your support's been absolutely incredible so far. And so if you did enjoy this episode as well, be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review as well on Apple Podcasts. And definitely 
be sure to follow us on our new Instagram page. Uh, I'll put the link in the description as all the episode announcements will be on there. So yeah, my name's been Cena and I'll see you in the next episode.